It's my uh, job and my honor to uh, be the moderator of this uh, panel about the historical role of government. Uh, to judge from uh, Jeff's experience at the last panel, my job is to introduce people and let their uh, brilliance wash over me uh, and then uh, open it up for the rest of you to take part in the conversation. We have um, this, the last panel did a terrific job, it seemed to me, in, in talking about how we got to the state where there was so much distrust and suspicion of government. Uh, and Bob Herbert and Kim Phillips-Fine and Rick Perlstein and Joe Soss did a great job against that point. We're going to go back, in effect, a little bit in time now and walk through you know, what historical role of government in the United States was and you know, what it was about that that has so excited the right and the business community and others who've been spending the last 40 years trying to undermine the role of government. Uh, Jeff wrote a great book, actually, a couple of years ago called The Case for Big Government, uh, which I reviewed at one point uh, and favorably. That's how we met, I think. Thank uh, you, Gary. That and uh, yes, you're welcome. I think I, you sold one and a half copies, thanks to my, uh, my review. Um, and it really showed, and one of the things that was fascinating to me about the book, a uh, small but very important book, was that there was uh, no, uh, no period of time, no halcyon day from the point of view of the right where the government was just getting out of everybody's way. From the very, very beginning in the United States, uh, for instance, economic growth had everything to do in the first century of American life with the investments in infrastructure the government made through the postal, postal service, roads and highways, and so on. So it's a myth to say that there was a period of time where government was minimal and unengaged and that only in, let's say, the New Deal period, the progressive era, did that begin to change. And one of the things I think we're going to do today is unpack some of that. Uh, so uh, we have three, well, complicated. Uh, we had four <laughs> panelists. <laughs> Sean uh, Valenz uh, can't be here today because of a family uh, illness. Uh, Patty Limerick. Uh, is the faculty director and the chair of the board of the Center for the Study of American West at Colorado University, um, is not here either because she's very sick. And I'm very disappointed about that because her bio, which was circulated to you, calls her an energetic, funny, and engaging public speaker. So it's a high <laughs> standard for you, Jeff. And uh, Jeff is going to actually read her paper about the uh, Department of the Interior. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the American West, and then uh, Robert Hockett, who's a professor of law at Cornell Law School, where he teaches in enterprise organizational and finance regulatory law, uh, and is also a visiting professor at the Sorbonne and uh, a fellow at the Century Foundation, and a regular consultant to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, is going to follow uh, 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 Patty slash Jeff. Uh, and then Bob Leininger, is, uh, who's been immersed in the history of the New Deal for the last 25 years and uh, published two books, actually, if I got the math right, in 2007, a very prolific year, Long Range Public Investment, The Forgotten Legacy of the New Deal, and Building Louisiana, The Legacy of the Public Works Administration. He's particularly interested in the architecture of New Deal buildings. In talking about the New Deal, he's going to do a little uh, audiovisual presentation that will be uh, very liven us all up. So. We'll start with Jeff, go in the following order, and then we'll have plenty of time for a little exchange among the panelists and questions. So Jeff uh, channeling Patty Limerick. Yeah, I, I Patty very much wanted to be here. She did get quite ill. She even thought of uh, coming in any case. Uh, she did ask me to read her remarks. So this is no, uh, this is not vanity on my part, and I realize, uh, I hope it's not too punishing for you all. I will do my best. They're very interesting remarks. Uh, she was especially pleased that us Eastern uh, intellectuals did not ignore the development of the West, which is partly why she would have been so excited to be here. And uh, she's probably the leading authority in uh, the areas in which she does, uh, in which she does do research. And uh, I think we're going to publish part of her book on uh, part of her book on the Department of the Interior. I know ne most of you never thought you'd read a book of, on the Department of the Interior, but in fact, uh, you might find this a very interesting book. Uh, it's going to be in our library section of our new website, Rediscovering Government. So I'll do my best. Okay, if I see you nodding off, or if you choose to want me to stop, nod off, and I'll get the hint. <laughs> In 19, uh, uh, the American West is the title as the essential laboratory for the study of dependence on and also resentment of the federal government. In 1947, in the essay, The West Against Itself, I did ask Orson Welles 
uh, to read this, but he was not available. <laughs> I'm starting to get embarrassed. Uh, Bernard de Voto made his most famous remark. The feelings of Westerners toward the federal government, he said, quote, shakes down to a platform. What did people think? They said, get out and give us more money. <laughs> Bernard de Voto saw the nation's future, and in a way that drove him wild with frustration. This future seemed to work. In 1963, a considerably more mild-mannered writer, historian John, and I'm not familiar with this man, Schlebecker, published a book called, uh, most of you have read this, Cattle Raising on the Plains, 1900 to 1961. Here's a quote from it. By late October, we're talking about 1934 year, the government had spent nearly $525 million in a single year to save cattlemen from ruin and starvation. Uh, and then he went on to say, for this salvation, many cattlemen never forgave the government. Large numbers of them resented the help. Let me go on with Patty's comments. Why did Western residents of the 19th and 20th centuries manifest such a remarkable combination of dependence on and also resentment of the federal government? Or to, to frame the same question in a more familiar context, why do teenagers manifest such a remarkable combination of dependence on and resentment of their parents? There is very little to puzzle over, actually, in these apparent contradictions. The dependence itself provides fertile ground for the resentment, making the West a kind of optimal, well-populated petri dish for the study of this issue. The conventional historical chronology of the rise of federal power by which a weak and small government was transformed by three phases of accelerated growth, these three being Teddy Roosevelt's progressive era, FDR's New Deal, and LBJ's Great Society never worked very well for Western historians. In a frequently quoted declaration in 1992, historian Richard White spoke for many of us in noting a key dimension of the region's <coughs> national significance. While the federal government shaped the West, the West itself serves as the kindergarten of the American state. In governing the American West, the state grew in power and influence. What did this mean in on-the-ground practice? Here are several arenas. One, for the first she talks about, the acquisition of territory through the Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican-American War, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the acquisition of the Oregon Territories after years of joint occupation with Britain bringing back all that high school history, right? The exploration of land and the inventory of natural resources by a series of, quote, bureaucrats of the, in the wilderness, unquote. Lewis and Clark, the Corps of Topographical Engineers, the great surveys after the Civil War, the US Geological Survey. Three, the conquest, relocation, and confinement of Indian peoples by the Army, and later the Office of Indian Affairs the survey, sale, and distribution of the public domain into private ownership by the General Land Office. This year, 2012, is the 200th anniversary of this ancestor agency, today's Bureau of Land Management. Let me go on with a few more examples. The formalization of a system for the allocation of mineral resources, the 1872 mining law, the creation and funding of territorial governments, not everyone was a state uh, right away. I've always reminded that uh, there was female suffrage in the territories of Wyoming and so forth long before there was in the United States of America. Uh, the planning, authorizing, and subsidizing of transportation routes and services. Add all this up, there's no mistaking the fact that federal support made individualistic, self-reliant opportunity-seeking, pioneering, viable. I'll repeat that because to me that's the theme. Federal support made individualism, self-reliance, and opportunity-seeking possible. Or more accurately, uh, let me move on here. Almost immediately after the United States secured its independence from Britain, it turned to the continent's interior and in in acquired an empire of its own. When the original states ceded their western lands to the new nation, not a small compromise, by the way, 
Uh, a giant paradox took up residence in the core of the federal government. A key passage in his influential article, The Myth of the Weak American State, William Novak uh, cites Jack, the historian Jack Green, quote, the American state grew by developing effective mechanisms for policing an ever-expanding and diverse territory. When the U.S. acquired its own empire, the nation had, in a very unsettling way, come to resemble the very empire it had just rebelled against. This was befuddling to the American people in the past, as Secretary of the Inter Interior Ken Salazar said could certainly testify. It has not lost its power, uh, the interior, well, let me skip this. Keep going here. A further complication arises from the fact that in orchestrating and overseeing westward expansion, federal agencies assembled a remarkably ratty record in ethics and integrity in this vast historical process process. In transforming the public domain into private property, the General Land Office represented a great current of opportunity for fraud and profiteering. The concept of conflict of interest took a long time to appear in the world of federal uh, land surveyors and land agents. Over the 19th century, having enormous tracts of land to allocate provided this opportunity for corruption and uh, getting rich. The Office of Indian Affairs also offers a troubling story in the capacity of the federal government to do harm while at the same time deploying the lofty rhetoric of guardianship and service to civilization. Some of the bad behavior of Indian agents involved manipulation of the purchase and distribution of supplies, equipment, rations, and so forth. The leasing of tribal lands for grazing and minerals was another disturbing zone. Perhaps even more troubling were uh, the official policies of unilateral coercion, constraints on Indians' mobility, prohibiting travel, invasion and disruption of Indian households with the seizure of children sent to distant boarding schools, and so on. In other words, between the General Land Office and Office of Indian Affairs, people hoping to make a simple defense of big government as a necessity for civil, civic well-being might want to conjure up their own bout of amnesia and skip the history of the American West. Western history makes it untenable to dismiss or deny the great power of the federal government to do harm and to exer exercise tyranny. And yet that circumstance adds yet another reason to fight the amnesia. The ratty record of the General Land Office and the Office of Indian Affairs provides a foundation of realistic thinking about how human pow power and human nature. The darkness in the human soul I'll let uh, Patty talk about the darkness in the human soul on her own. Not that I'm denying it's true. For years, acquaintances who knew of my interest in the Department of Interior and the federal bureaucracy urged me to read Franz Kafka, who is a, quite an expert in this area. For years, I was successful in persuading myself I didn't have to. Then I surrendered. Let me move on. Uh, you, yeah, I like Kafka, but I think you get the idea. No? <laughs> all right. All right. It's your, then you're, you take responsibility for me. Right? Uh, when the next commission uh, forms to undertake the reinvention, reform, and reconfiguring of the federal government, it wouldn't be the worst idea for the group to start by reading the castle uh, and inviting a Kafka expert to the discussion. Over the course of the 20th century, the centrality of the federal government to Western American life only expanded. I have, in the quixotic effort to fit these remarks into the tight space, steered clear of the topic of the giant shift toward permanent federal retention of a good share of the public domain in the West. With half or more of the area of Western states designated as public lands, the relationship between the West and most of this national monuments, forests, parks, and so forth, the relationship between the West and the federal government took on a new dimension. From the funding and orchestration of large water projects in the arid and semi-arid West to efforts to control the U.S.-Mexican border, from the appropriation of the West wide open spaces for military bases, bombing ranges, and nuclear weapons production sites, the story of fe the federal government and the story of the West have continued to weave themselves into an extremely instructive and important knot. 
And at this stage, I shift to announcing my ambition to secure the prize for the strangest and most unnerving conclusion ever offered at a conference on government and public policy. In thinking about the West and the way it got the jump on a lot of the contemporary anti-government attitudes, I could not get a story by the science fiction writer Ray Bradbury out of my mind. I actually tried very hard to get it out of my mind, uh, uh, but I lost the battle with myself. In the story Skeleton, Bradbury tells the tale of Mr. Harris, a man who has become obsessed with his skeleton. Mr. Harris has been feeling pain in his bones, and his conventional physician has told him there is nothing wrong and urged him to stop worrying. He finds himself unable to take that advice, can't get his mind off his skeleton. With every step, he realized just how dependent he was on this other thing, writes Bradbury. As Mr. Harris feels himself more and more at war with his skeleton, he desperately seeks the help of a strange medical professional who he summons to make a house call. Since Harris could not stand another moment of coexisting with his skeleton, the procedure he then underwent would, I guess, have to be counted as a success. His wife's return there to their home concludes the story. Uh, it was not so bad, well, this is not very pleasant, but anyway. <laughs> it was not so bad finding an intact gelatin skin jellyfish in one's living room. One could step back from it. It was when the jellyfish called me by my name. Well, what an awful story, you're right. Who in their right mind would think of taking this story and using it as an analogy for the phenomenon of anti-government attitudes in the American West? But my defeat was, when reading the story, I, I came upon the astonishing remark that Mr. Harris made to our troubled husband. I can tell you that you and your skeleton are one and the same, one nation, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. United you stand, divided you fall. United you will stand, Mr. Harris, and divided you will fall in a heap like a jellyfish. If Westerners ever succeeded in getting the federal government out of their affairs, they would land in a heap that would bear a direct resemblance to Mr. Harris's former hus Mrs. Harris's former husband. If the wilder members of the anti-government movement of the early 20th century succeed in their cause, civil society would reach a state very close to Mr. Harris's poorly supported phys physique. To exact on a less whack to exit exact. I return to historian John Schle uh, Schlebecker and his valuable book, Cattle Raising on the Plains. By the way, there's a copy for each of you as you leave. <laughs> well, cattlemen have always seen themselves as fiercely independent, neither seeking nor receiving help from anyone, and certainly not getting help from the government, he said. Yet the slightest glance at the record reveals countless efforts by cattlemen to get government assistance of one sort or another. They continually sought help and they often got it. And then, bringing his reflections into port, John Schlebecker uh, sketched for and reached a tranquility of point of view of this paradox that in 2012, today I am doing my best to emulate. Quote, this is true, and it is neither bad nor good, just true. So thanks, Jeff. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, so I'm uh, supposed to talk a little bit about the role uh, of government, um, this, this sort of historic role uh, you know, of government in American economic development. Uh, and it's, it's sort of hard to look at the history uh, of governmental roles uh, in economic development or redevelopment for that matter without concluding that the history of that role is the history of development itself, right, or the history of uh, redevelopment itself. That's the case if you look at Germany's uh, takeoff uh, in the late uh, 19th century. It's the case if you look at Japan's uh, economic takeoff in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Uh, and it's, of course, the case if you look at America's um, economic takeoff, or indeed even economic exception, um, uh, inception, sorry, uh, in the late uh, 18th century. That means it's kind of difficult to sort of decide what precisely to talk about when one's talking about that particular subject. Uh, and that in turn means that any selection is apt to be at least potentially uh, arbitrary. Uh, my selection of case studies, uh, I hope, is not arbitrary. Essentially, it stems from what I teach um, in, uh, over at the Cornell uh, Law School. Uh, so I'm essentially going to uh, reference three particular uh, cases that are especially surprising, I think, to many people. In other words, these are cases where the role of 
government was um, absolutely important and was constitutive of the markets in question that I'm about to talk about uh, and was constitutive of the phenomena in question that I'm going to talk about. And what's surprising, of course, is that these are very familiar phenomena uh, and yet the constitutivity of a governmental role in the cases of these phenomena is, is doesn't seem to be uh, very well known, right? So let me begin uh, first then uh, with the matter of limited liability. So one of the courses that I teach over at the Cornell Law School uh, is uh, called Business Organizations. It's essentially a course on enterprise organizational law. That means it's a course about the various legal structures that sort of contour the forms of business through which we conduct enterprising and productive activity uh, in this country. Now, um, naturally, we begin uh, then with the first uh, form of firm, which is one of the simplest and most primitive, and that is the uh, general partnership form. Now, my students will tell you um, that I seem to be, I seem to have a kind of hippie-like uh, sort of utopian obsession uh, with the general partnership form uh, in particular, uh, partly owing to its norms of mutuality and, and sort of workplace democracy, right? The idea that essentially all of those who are involved in uh, a traditional partnership are involved in a common enterprise and thus they are exercising a kind of common agency. They are sort of working together, formulating plans, visions, goals together uh, and democratically deciding what to do. And that is uh, indeed one attractive feature of that particular enterprise organizational form. But another attractive feature uh, of that form uh, is the fact that it is uh, possessed of unlimited joint and several liability on the part of the partners for the harms that the partnership might cause. That includes harms in contract uh, and uh, more importantly, I think, harms in tort. So. Um, you might think, well, isn't that strange? I mean, how could that ever have been the case? Haven't we always had limited liability? Um, the kind of, um, that, that particular feature that uh, so characterizes so many other enterprise organizational forms. Uh, and the answer is, is no, um, that the general partnership form used to be the dominant form of American enterprise organizational form. Uh, and I'll tell this to my students and they'll sort of express surprise at first. And I'll say, well, if you think about it, it's not really so surprising if you ask yourself, um, ask yourselves what one common synonym of the word liability might be, and they'll kind of scratch their heads, they'll wonder, because they think it's an entirely legal technical term, therefore it must not have any correlate uh, in ordinary uh, language. And then I say, well, isn't limited liability just a, a synonym uh, or a term that's synonymous with another term that we could call limited accountability, right? And then they'll sort of, you know, little light bulbs will go off and you'll say, well, that's what it is, right? I mean, there's a sense, and, and we, we think of ourselves as a culture that values accountability, right? Where people are responsible for the harms that they cause. It's also not too difficult to see how there might have been something at least initially counterintuitive or troubling about the idea of limited liability when it was first introduced, if you ask yourselves, if you perform, say, a, a, a thought experiment. So imagine you had an organization, a, a business firm, that called itself Murder Incorporated, okay? So, and this is a company that actually commits hits, right? Now, imagine furthermore that this firm, Murder Incorporated, is capitalized by lots of people who put in money and essentially are passive investors, right? They don't act in any way other than to put their money in the firm. Does anybody think, right, that if this particular firm were found out, uh, and indeed it succeeded in committing a hit, that those who contributed capital to it would not be found liable in conspiracy? The answer is, of course, no, they would be liable in conspiracy. There's a sense in which when a limited liability organization commits mass torts, right, even when they're not criminal, but they are exceedingly harmful, there's a sense in which the shareholders, the passive investors, are as responsible for those particular torts, right, those particular harms that are caused, as would be contributors of capital to a hit squad, right, a, a murder incorporated organization. However, as it happens, we give shareholders in limited liability firm forms limitations on their liability, even for torts, right? That's to say, even when we have creditors of the firm who are involuntary creditors, creditors who didn't know what they were getting themselves into because they didn't choose to transact with the firm, but rather their transactions took the form of being hit by a truck or being uh, uh, sort of had uh, toxic chemicals spilled nearby or fires uh, set by sparks being thrown off by uh, locomotives or, or what have you. Any time you have victims of that sort, if they can't be 
be made whole by the, cap by the capital that the firm itself holds, right? If they can't be made whole by the firm, that's it. They're simply out of luck, unless, of course, the firm has maintained liability insurance, and indeed, if it has, it's typically been required to maintain that. So limited liability uh, represents something of a, sig a significant exception from the sort of general norms that governed American sort of ethical thinking, uh, and indeed, uh, common law norms uh, as well, which were viewed back in the 19th century and before uh, as constituting a kind of natural law of fairness that wasn't really government produced or government created, but was simply at most government enforced. That means uh, that recognition of limited liability on the part of governments required governments to become active and essentially to displace traditions, uh, a, a kind of traditional customary law that was the common law that had been in place for centuries. Now, why might it have done that? Well, um, the answer is fairly clear, it seems, when you look back at history. Essentially, and how did it begin, for that matter? I guess it's, it's sort of how, how, this, how this sort of history unfolded is sort of, um, um, if you look at sort of the, the very beginnings, uh, you can sort of see the sense in which limited liability as we currently have it essentially amounted to a kind of development strategy. So initially, um, back in the early 19th century, uh, if government wanted to uh, encourage the development of certain kinds of infra infrastructure, it required that somebody be investing uh, in the activity that would result in the building or the construction of that infrastructure. So let's say you've got somebody who wants a, a government instrumentality, would like to see a bridge uh, built across the Charles River, right, connecting Cambridge to Boston or something of that sort. Uh, if it had had to rely uh, solely on a partnership, uh, to do that, um, essentially uh, what you would have had would have been lots of people who would have been a little bit less willing or a little bit less ready uh, to participate in the partnerships that would have constructed those forms of infrastructure precisely because had there been some flaw in the structure that the partnership had built in the bridge, that's to say, and had then somebody come to grief, had somebody been harmed by dint of that fact, and had the partnership then not had sufficient capitalization to make whole those who were harmed by the flaw in the design of the structure, then the partners themselves would have been tappable for uh, that which the firm itself couldn't pay out. In other words, the unlimited joint and several li liability of the partners, it was thought, would have constituted something of a disincentive uh, among many people out there in the world to, uh, against investing uh, in the project in question. So limited liability in the States uh, began as essentially very limited limitations on liability. In essence, what you would do is seek a, a franchise from the state, from a government instrumentality. You would ask for the privilege, and it was indeed called a privilege back then and was widely considered a privilege. You would ask for the privilege of limited liability with the purpose of forming a firm with one very specific purpose in mind that could be widely recognized to be a public purpose, right? Something we all want. We all need this bridge. We all need this piece of infrastructure. We all need that kind of infrastructure. For those purposes, then, we will allow a firm to form, uh, and we will allow its capitalizers, those who contribute capital to it, uh, the privilege of limited liability so that they themselves won't be uh, potentially liable in tort in the event that the project ends up being problematic or causing harm. So for a long time, uh, in consequence, corporations, corporate charters, had to sort of state the particular purpose of the corporation. The, co the purpose had to sound in public concern or in, as a kind of public good, and then in return for limiting your activities as a firm to that very well cabined, very well contained public purpose, your shareholders would enjoy limited liability, otherwise not. Um, now you can still see vestiges of this old regime in corporate charters even to this day. To this day you'll find oftentimes a charter will say, this corporation exists for the following purposes. The trouble, if you see it this way, if you find it problematic, is that the purposes are to make money, right? They're not sort of, they don't necessarily sound in public goods. They don't necessarily sound in infrastructure uh, investment or anything of that sort. Uh, but there was a time, right, when you had to stick to that purpose in order to continue to enjoy the limited liability shield. Uh, and for that reason, there was a very well used doctrine in corporate law, which was known as the ultra vires doctrine, which means the firm is acting outside of its powers, outside of its confined powers, its enumerated powers. In other words, corporate charters used to be like Federalists view our own American Constitution as being 
documents of limited powers. Um, and otherwise, if you exceeded those powers, you didn't enjoy the limited liability shield. So essentially, you can view limited liability itself, something people tend to think of as a kind of a natural, a fact of nature or something that's not government produced or government um, uh, recognized in any particular sense. You can view limited liability itself as a case of government activism as against the backdrop of the common law, which was not at the time seen as a government product, but was seen as the natural law that we all lived according to, the, the law of fairness. Um, that's the first instance. And again, I think it's worth noting just because it's so surprising to so many people. It's so unfamiliar. Second instance, um, another one that's surprising. So you'll hear a lot of people, of course, this came up in the previous panel, a lot of people will uh, attribute our recent financial difficulties uh, to our system of home finance. Uh, and many of those who will attribute our recent financial difficulties to one particular part or component of our uh, national system of home mortgage finance, namely um, that part that's constituted by the GSEs, Fannie uh, and Freddie. What these people either, can, what the people who sort of make this charge uh, seem regularly either to forget uh, or perhaps intentionally to omit or perhaps some combination of both or something in between, uh, is that this very system of uh, federally assisted home finance was put into place in a bipartisan manner, both by the Hoover administration and by the early Roosevelt administration, and functioned marvelously well from about the early mid-1930s, even, yeah, let's say the early 1930s, until the mid to late 1990s virtually flawlessly. It's only after, in the last 10 years or so, that things sort of came to grief. And interestingly enough, that's also the 10 years in which the private sector got more and more and more into the act. So what's the story here? Well, a lot of people seem to have forgotten or perhaps never to have learned that back in the late 1920s, we had not just a stock market crash, but a real estate market crash as well that followed on a significant real estate bubble. If you want to read about it, um, a terrific source is Frederick Lewis Allen's book, uh, Only Yesterday. But you could also have a look at uh, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's book, uh, The Great Crash, as well, which gives a somewhat more uh, sort of impressionistic view of things. In any event, there was a huge real estate bubble in a lot of the same states, the sand states, as there has been more, more recently uh, in the 1990s and early 2000s. The real estate bubble crashed. Then shortly thereafter, of course, the stock market bubble burst. That, uh, of course, as we know, resulted in widespread unemployment, not just across the economy as a whole, but with a special concentration for a, a period of time in the home building industry. And as it happens, a huge portion of all employment in the United States was either stemming directly from the home building uh, industry or from industries that were closely connected to and dependent upon the home building industry, materials industry, asphalt, concrete, uh, lumber, and, and the like, and of course, construction. Right. So so when the markets both had crashed, um, by the time we get into the early 1930s, um, the uh, late Hoover administration finds itself faced with this mass unemployment developing, in particular in the home building industry. Furthermore, it finds lots of people beginning to default on their mortgages and being evicted from their homes. This is even before Roosevelt comes into office. Why might that have been? Well, part of the reason was a lot of people don't seem to realize or know uh, that back in those days, you couldn't get a 30-year mortgage. In order to buy a home back in the 20s, you could get at best a 5 to 10 year mortgage. Most mortgage uh, terms uh, were actually shorter than that. That meant you had to refinance quite regularly. Furthermore, you couldn't buy a home by putting 10 or 20 percent down. You typically had to put 50 percent or more down in order to buy a home. That all was owing to a number of factors, but one was there was no default insurance available to lenders uh, for mortgage lending. It was also partly because we had fragmented real estate markets on a state-by-state -state basis. And it was also because we had a state fragmented, a state-by-state -state fragmented home loaning, uh, lending uh, industry. So in consequence, the, the sort of the upshot of all of this was even before the crash, we were a country in which well below 40% of American families or households owned their own homes. We like to think of ourselves as these homesteaders, we've always owned our homes and so forth. We weren't a nation of homeowners, as far as the majority is concerned, back in the 1920s, or early 1930s. What happened? Well, we subsequently became a nation in which close to 70% 
percent of Americans own their home. We developed an ownership society in that sense. That ownership society was the product of, above all else, of the New Deal. In fact, I know one, I have one friend who's an historian um, who back when Bush was talking about an ownership society, this friend said, well, we, we, we had uh, an ownership society. It was called the New Deal. Um, and I think he's right. So what happened? Well, first of all, um, Hoover introduced uh, the home loan bank system and essentially created a kind of parallel structure to that of the Federal Reserve System itself for the home loan banks, which facilitated reserve pooling and risk pooling among the home loan lenders, right? That was a first important step. Next important step came uh, with the Roosevelt administration, uh, and that came with the uh, Federal Housing Act, which brought you the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, which we still have to this day, and which to this day remains one of the only government instrumentalities that continues to operate in the black, that is never actually representing a cost to the public fisc, but is actually bringing profits to the public fisc. What did FHA do? The most innovative uh, uh, change that FHA introduced was home mortgage default insurance. Essentially, it said, we will ensure home loans against default provided that they meet certain criteria. The criteria were, of course, such as to include, first, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage. That was a product of that era. And of course, that remains the dominant mortgage form to this day, and was an especially dominant mortgage form from the early 30s on down until uh, the uh, sort of worst of the most recent uh, bubble years. So the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, of course, was something that basically even, not, even financially non-savvy home buyers could kind of live with, right? There was a predictability. There was a certainty to it. Um, furthermore, they could put down a much smaller amount uh, by way of down payment precisely because the default insurance that the government offered made creditors a bit more confident um, about lending. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, quality standards on the homes themselves were required as well. The government didn't want to be potentially holding bad housing stock in the event that there were defaults. So essentially, the quality, the building, the quality of the building of the homes uh, improved uh, markedly from the 1930s on because of those particular uh, uh, conditions that FHA attached to the insurance in addition to the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, okay? Before that, it had always been thought that you couldn't have uh, mortgage default insurance. For whatever reason, private actors seemed fearful to step into things, probably partly because of the state-by-state -state fragmentation of real estate markets uh, and uh, financial markets. Okay, so that was the, the first sort of fundamental uh, change introduced by the Roosevelt administration. Shortly thereafter, four years later, um, some people in the Roosevelt administration got this terrific idea. They thought, what if, you know, we, we see uh, uh, interest rates uh, on home loans coming down by dint of the default insurance that we're offering. What if we could bring those rates down even more by enabling the lenders to get the loans off of their books, to liquefy them when necessary? In other words, enabling them to sort of sell off their loans. Et voila, we had in 1938 the creation of Fannie Mae, the first sort of secondary market maker in mortgages. It was at the time, of course, a government-sponsored entity, and it just drove me nuts. I remember in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I was a student of law and finance, people would talk about this great new development called securitization and how these, these wonderfully innovative private people out there in the <coughs> have invented this thing called securitization. And I would say, no, actually they didn't. Um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt <laughs> invented sec uh, securitization in a sense. If you think of if, if you mean by securitization, essentially the creation of a secondary market in instruments that had previously only had a primary market and the creation of the secondary market precisely in order to render lending rates even lower. So Fannie Mae was created in 1938. It was willing to purchase mortgage then, mortgages off the books of various lending institutions in the event, uh, provided that they were FHA conforming, which is to say they would be 30-year fixed rates uh, and that the housing that would, uh, that's serving as collateral was of high quality uh, and, and so forth. So uh, in any event, Fannie uh, continued on as uh, a government-sponsored entity and a government-owned entity from 1938 to 1968, worked like a charm, it was privatized in 1968. Freddie was created in 1968 at the same time so that there would be at least one competitor to Fannie out there in the privatized, the now privatized secondary mortgage market, and those two basically private institutions that indeed uh, nevertheless had the, the implicit federal guarantee 
continued on quite well from 1968 to about 1998, early 2000s. It was only once the bubble got underway, and we can talk more about what effect the bubble had later, that Fannie and Freddie came to grief. But as we've already, as was noted in the previous panel, Fannie and Freddie came to nothing like the grief that private institutions did. In any event, we were transformed by these programs from a nation in which fewer than 40 percent own their own homes to a nation in which nearly 70 percent did. That was all government created, and a lot of people don't seem to realize that. And they talk about Fannie and Freddie as though they were sort of recent government impositions that somehow uh, ended a beautiful party. Um, and it's quite, it couldn't be, they, they, we couldn't be sort of more 180 degrees off uh, than that. Uh, I had one other instance, but it looks like I'm out of time, so I'll, um, I'll sort of leave it at that for uh, now. Except maybe one last thing. Um, you've heard of another uh, organization that has May in its name, uh, Sally uh, May. Uh, it does much of what Fannie Mae does, the same sort of thing. That's no accident. That was federally created as well in the late 50s, early 60s when we decided, oh, those Russians have just put a satellite up in outer space called Sputnik. We better do something to uh, facilitate cheaper financing of higher education. And of course, as we now see, um, higher education finance seems to be in a bit of, uh, of, of a state as well, uh, owing to certain encroachments made by private uh, parties onto what was once a perfectly well-functioning federal uh, system. Okay, I'll stop for now. Bob Leininger. It's a privilege to be among all these wonderful scholars. Mike, Mike, Mike. Mike, Mike. <coughs> How are we doing? Better? Better. Okay. I'm very pleased to be among all these. No. Higher. Is it on? Does it go higher? Maybe it's the mic. Why don't I take it off? How's that? Is that better? All right. Anyway, once again, thanks for being here. Thanks Is for having me be here. It's on. Ah, okay. Keep it close to my lips. I'll try to hold up my end of program, uh, which is fairly simple. I will tell you why, how the New Deal created the backbone of our physical and cultural infrastructure, uh, particularly with reference to New York. I'll do it all in 15 minutes, so hold on your ready. <laughs> it's probably no surprise to this audience that the New Deal is one of the most creative outpourings of public policy initiatives in our history, and probably no surprise that some of those uh, programs built things. It may be a surprise to you to know how many of them there were. Here are 12. Uh, I'm constantly surprised by the many facets of the New Deal, so something may pop up at any minute, but I don't think I've left out anything important. I think it's important that you see this list because uh, it's often an impression that the New Deal was some kind of monolithic juggernaut, and in fact, it was a wonderful hodgepodge of, of uh, ad hoc programs with uh, different leadership and different purposes and different structures, some of which were so jury-rigged, it's amazing they lasted as long as they did. They had different successes and different failures. Uh, I can't talk about all of them, but I will mention four, and Bob has already talked about one, so I'm, I'm ahead of the game there. Uh, number one, most people, or many people anyway, have heard of the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a program that packed off young men to the boonies to uh, plant trees, stop soil erosion, fight forest fires, uh, make our national parks and monuments more accessible and, and user-friendly, and create whole systems of state parks where none existed before. Uh, then some people remember three down, four, five, yes five from the bottom, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Uh, but that's kind of where it stops. Everything else gets put under the big umbrella of the WPA. But before the WPA, there was the BWA. Confusion is understandable. Uh, this was done in 1933 to do the heavy lifting, the traditional public works, the, the dams, the, the bridges, the hospitals, the university buildings, etc. cetera. Uh, but this took planning, it took heavy machinery, <coughs> it took skilled labor and it didn't get started very quickly, therefore it did not soak up a lot of unskilled labor. So we needed the Civil Works Administration, five down. <coughs> that was to do <coughs> labor-intensive projects like streets and sidewalks and parks and playgrounds. It had white-colored jobs for, for librarians and nurses, archaeologists. Uh, if you're in the southwest in my neck of the woods, you will notice that a lot of the digs were done in the 30s by uh, 
CWA archaeologists, and later the WPA and the CCC built uh, museums and walkways and roads and these same sites. They had the first uh, arts programs, the uh, Coit Tower murals now uh, slowly rotting, uh, were, were done by CWA artists. So uh, it was very successful. It was enormously successful. Uh, in two months, the CWA had four million people working, four million people. There were more shovel-ready projects than there were shovels, literally. <clears throat> but it was expensive. Uh, it scared Roosevelt. Uh, he was hoping that the uh, recovery was just around the corner. He didn't like the thought that he was going to have to spend this much money to end the Depression. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> <clears throat> so after four and a half months, he pulled the plug. But the uh, Depression was not over, not even nearby. So we had to have a second iteration of the uh, or a reiteration of the CWA, which was the Works Progress Administration, which did, as they did, uh, labor-intensive projects. Generally, the rule of thumb is, if you're looking at something New Deal, as big as PWA, if it's smaller, it's WPA, although there are uh, exceptions to that rule, too. Okay. Uh, this is a public service announcement. I'm not uh, going to talk about uh, murals, but again, to get you to realize the different facets of the New Deal, there was not just one program doing murals. There were, what, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the murals that we all know and love in post office was not done by WPA, by the Treasury Department Section of Fine Arts. Okay, let's go to some real projects. Uh, Central Park Zoo has been remodeled uh, since the 30s, but some of the original buildings are there, uh, and that's one of them. I would like to believe that that lovely eagle over there was maybe a CWA uh, contribution. Up further on the uh, <clears throat> park, the Conservatory Gardens. Sorry I wasn't there when flowers were blooming, but most of you have seen that, so you know it's a neat place. Now let's get to uh, more traditional public works, like a courthouse in Brooklyn, a million and a half. And in Jamaica, five and a half million. I, the Jamaicans must have more uh, court work than the <laughs> Brooklynites. <coughs> That's a big building. Lots and lots and lots of schools all <coughs> over the place. These are just two. Manhasset, uh, Franklin Lane in, in Brooklyn, three million dollars for a high school. A lot of money in those days. But as you can see, it's a sizable building and, and lots of people uh, got to use it. Brooklyn College, five Six buildings, I think, in Brooklyn College, which I imagine was the basic uh, <coughs> campus at that point. I may get out there Friday, I hope so. Uh, I went looking for Jewish Memorial Hospital and couldn't find it, so that may not be still around, but there it is, a million dollars. Um, taking the tramway down into Roosevelt Island, you'll see this building here, which was a nurse's home that was serving a hospital for uh, the back of it uh, for uh, tubercular folks. Uh, when I saw it, it was abandoned. Anybody who'd been there recently, it's a good prospect for condos, and I hope that's what it's doing now. But it was not being used there. Uh, just on the other side of that uh, building is this powerhouse that served the, the hospital. Another uh, bit of, of health here, the nurse's home, pardon me for forgetting the apostrophe, in Kings County, two million. Uh, and then the darker side here, the Bronx County Jail, a million and a half. Uh, the New Deal had an enormous impact on public health. At the beginning, about 30% of us were drinking uh, safe water. Uh, industrialization and, and uh, uh, urbanization were pumping all sorts of junk into streets and streets. <coughs> well, streets too. Streams, rivers, lakes. Uh, and into the wells, in, into the aquifer. We were probably uh, very close to having all kinds of interesting ec epidemics in the late 30s, but uh, sewage treatment plants like this and this, 24 million bucks, it, it covered a good deal of Manhattan. Uh, by the end of the New Deal, 70% of us had safe water and other garbage disposal <coughs> efforts here uh, on uh, 12th Avenue. There were two of them. So the 3.8 million covered a couple of these buildings, a little bit more modest out of the Maranek. We have this little reservoir here, but still half a million dollars. 
Uh, water was not just for, for drinking and waste disposal, but also for fighting fires. So we have this pumping station here on Coney Island. Ah, and the mighty Triborough Bridge. $49 million. The Lincoln Tunnel, $83 million. They also did the Queen's Midtown Tunnel. Can't tell you how much that, how much that costs, but probably something comparable. Post offices, lots of post offices. Treasury did have their own budget, did build their own uh, post offices during the New Deal, but PWA did most of them. Here is Madison Square. Here is one in the Bronx. Uh, 140th Street, uh, College Station. Hospitals again. <coughs> Bailey Seaton is on Staten Island. It was what was called a Marine Hospital, which has nothing to do with the Marine Corps. It was uh, for merchant marines, sailors who had been in exotic places and brought back exotic diseases, so maybe that's why it was on Staten Island. Uh, it's, a big, it's a big complex. A little more modest. Uh, uh, now we're getting some WPA projects here. Most of this stuff is PWA because that's what I know most about. Uh, <coughs> by the way, this is what we call in sociology an opportunity sample. They were buildings that I happened to be in front of with a camera or that I happened to be able to lift out of a, a book that uh, PWA published in 1939. But it's the tip of the iceberg. They're all over the place. Uh, the Irish, or Polish, I guess, was giving me the eye uh, <clears throat> after I was taking several pictures, so I went over and talked to him, asked him about the building. He said it was holding up pretty well. If you're going to uh, Ellis Island, by ferry, you are going to that bump over there on the left. That is the ferry building. When I saw it, it was not in great shape. Uh, LaGuardia Airport. And also, LaGuardia Airport, the marine terminal. This was to be the uh, uh, <clears throat> eastern end of a transcontinental route for the flying boats, the, the uh, things you see in the Indiana Jones movies. Uh, the, the western end was, is still there on, on uh, uh, Angel Island, two large hangars that are now studios and so forth, and a terminal building if your car is, is your windows become people, but they had amenities that were comparable to and sometimes better than existing uh, <clears throat> middle class housing. Uh, <laughs> That's <clears throat> what I've got for you here. As I say, the tip of the iceberg. I hope you're impressed. Uh, this all happened in six or seven years, not a decade, just six or seven years. Uh, and so with apologies to Winston Churchill, I like to say never in our history was so much built for so many in so little time and been so thoroughly forgotten. <laughs> but we're here to remember. We're here to rediscover. Uh, there was a time in our history <coughs> a time of despair uh, where people fought back, they built, they invested in our future. It's still around. Most of it's still in use. So as we rediscover government, I hope we can also rediscover the courage to use it. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Uh, we have about, oh, a half an hour, I guess, until the lunch break. Uh, Jeff, I, we talked a little bit. Because we have uh, one fewer panelist, I was going to ask you to make a few additional remarks, uh, and okay. then we'll... Well, I'm going to go through about 200 years of history in uh, two or three minutes. <laughs> Bob... <laughs> going to show me up, huh? Bob, number one, uh, uh, talked about the development of the Limited Liability Corporation by government and how much that contributed to our entrepreneurialism and economic growth, and secondly, the housing market. I'm curious about your third instance. Bob number two talked about, and I think it was very useful to remind us of all these darn buildings that could be built by a government strapped for money that did not then believe in limitations. I also always thought that the irony of Ronald Reagan was that he called Jimmy Carter a man of limits, when in fact it was Ronald Reagan who taught us how limited our future was. Uh, and for some reason, we believed it very quickly. We never had a laissez-faire government, as Gary LaMarche <coughs> mentioned. Uh, the first great decision was Thomas Jefferson, who's the laissez-faire icon. He bought the Louisiana Purchase. Maybe the most important economic decision in American history. Uh, uh, I think George Washington fending off uh, dictatorship may have been a slightly more important decision in our history, but nevertheless, a pretty big one. We built the canals. Jefferson didn't, uh, the Jefferson uh, uh, government didn't really want to build that much in, rail in roads, but they eventually 
uh, did, but this, his same party in New York State and other states built the canals, which meant so much to commerce in America. Uh, There's a very good exhibit in the New York Historical Society. Uh, we keep forgetting about the education system in America. By 1850, we had a free primary education system that was the equivalent of the Prussian education system. Only 60 years after we signed the Constitution, we believed in education. For a while, they were charging tuition, a little bit of tuition. We even did away with that and made it completely free and mandatory. We built the high schools, some of which we saw. We tended to build them in the late 1800s, early 1900s. By the end of the 1800s, we were building a, uh, sanitation and water systems. New York City was a leader. We had running water very early in our history. It wasn't because General Electric did it. It was because government did it. In fact, there was a huge municipal, my friend Mike Wallace, the Gotham historian, tells me there was a huge municipalization movement in the late 1800s called, and, that, and early 1900s called the Age of Sanitation. I laughed a little bit about the Erie Canal because my wife and I went to the New York Historical Society. Even telling this may be slightly mean-spirited, but a man was very nicely taking his daughter around uh, to show him everything. And she said, what did the Erie Canal do? And he said, well, that was a great thing. And you know, built, finished in 1825. It brought fresh water to New York City and allowed <laughs> us to develop. Well, I didn't correct him. But in fact, government was the, the reason we had fresh water in New York City, if not fi fi about 50 to 60 years later. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to go on very long. I'd love to open this to questions. But, if, uh, but of course, we did lots of uh, road building along the way. We did lots of bridge building. We had the, the highways after World War II. We did lots of road building during the Depression. We had to dig out of the mud to accommodate the new cars and the new uh, automobiles. Uh, we we uh, subsidized college education after the war. We had the quite extraordinary National Institutes of Health. Uh, R&D out of, out of the federal government was critical to all kinds of things we have. You've all heard these lessons. The loss of faith in government in the 1970s, as I said from the very start, was the beginning, in my view, of the potential serious decline of America. And I use that word quite explicitly. It is not obvious this country, by historical, by comparison to other countries around the world, is not in decline. It has to revitalize itself. It just won't do it without government. And we have to get over this mythology and this misinformation about the purposes, uses, and constructive ability of government. One last point. Government is about change. We didn't know we needed high schools in 1789. That's probably why they're not in the Constitution. <laughs> we didn't know we needed sanitation. We didn't know, as today, as knowledge changes, we have new needs and government has to lead the way. My favorite is preschool. We now know that early education is vital to full lives. That's a job for government. It's not a job for General Electric or even Microsoft. Uh, that's what Rediscovering Government, this, this initiative is all about. Um, before bringing it around to the audience, I just wanted to, the, the theme that emerges from some of this panel and the previous one to me, or one that's interesting to me, is the disconnect between this rich history of what government has done and making everything uh, possible. Uh, including the private enterprise system, uh, and the uh, failure of people to really understand the connection of government. So when I listen to this, I li listen to the FH FHA example and the 30-year mortgage, which uh, greatly expanded home ownership. Many people have benefited from it and benefited from it today. Don't connect it to any action of government, I think, is the point you're trying to make. But if you go to Bob Leininger's presentation, the New Deal construction projects are often what are held up by people as a kind of a paradigm of visible government action. Now, everything can't be a construction that you can see, but it seems to me that those enjoyed, they, they enjoy now anyway, and I guess the question I want to ask is at the time, uh, a very positive and kind of benign public image. People could see that, the park, the school, and so on. Is that true? Was there any controversy at the time uh, about it? Uh, <clears throat> well. I don't think so once things got going. Uh, at the beginning, I, when I said there were more shovel-ready projects and there were shovels, I wasn't kidding. Uh, when, when CWA was starting, uh, uh, Harry Hopkins, who was head of FERA and later became head of, of uh, 
um, WPA called implement uh, tool manufacturers and said, look, I'm going to have a lot of people working here. you got enough inventory. And they said, oh, sure. Uh, and several weeks into the project, they were exhausted. And so what he had to do was go find warehouses with World War I surplus and get the wheelbarrows and the shovels and so forth out there. But for a while, you would have these public works projects where you have five guys standing around and one guy digging. And that was because there was just one shovel, not six. So both CWA and the PWA got, got bad press for that. But I think once they saw things actually going up, uh, it made a difference. It's kind of funny because it, you, you kind of associate uh, Art Deco style with public architecture in a way that only, only because the great flourishing period of that was, was the 1930s. You know. One of the reasons why we've forgotten the role of the New Deal in all right. this construction is there was no federal style imposed. It was uh, a local kind of thing. The cities and, and school boards and whatever decided what they wanted. They hired an architect, engineer. They passed it through PWA for engineering and financial and, and legal soundness. But they chose what things looked like. So uh, <clears throat> it could be Clabbert in New England. It could be Adobe right. in, in Santa Fe. Uh, there was one style that was common to a lot of, of New Deal public projects, which I call Greco Deco, other people call Star of Classicism. It was a combination of, of the classical uh, facade of, of base and column and entablature, except it was all simplified. The column got sucked back into the, the wall as pilasters, ornament was bas relief, and then there were these lovely deco doors and lights uh, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> so if you see one of those, you can guess it's probably a New Deal building. Otherwise, you know, there are 10 other New Deal buildings that don't mm. fit that model, so they're just hard to see. Yeah. All right, let's open it up. Uh, uh, Rick. Um, those buildings are, of course, so beautiful, and sometimes jocularly I say the reason the Great Society didn't succeed like the New Deal is it happened during a time when architecture was so ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it would be... Uh, you know, like insulting to bunkers to call some of the buildings in Hyde Park bunkers. But um, so when we know a lot about the economic decision making now in the Obama administration because of um, reporters like Noam Scheiber, and, um, uh, we know that Obama was advised that he couldn't have a big stimulus because there weren't enough quote unquote shovel ready projects. Why weren't there enough shovel ready projects? And is it too much to hope that some sort of rational kind of policy uh, can be created such that there will be, in a kind of turnkey fashion, shovel-ready projects uh, in, the wait, in the waiting for the next recession? I think it's failure of imagination. Uh, there are lots of schools around with leaky roofs, uh, uh, lots of things, lots of repairs, lots of, of well, these public housing projects, which are still with us, have been criminally unmaintained for the last 20 years, but they're still being lived in and, and actually liked. Uh, by the residents. They could be spruced up. Uh, instead, in New Orleans, they tore them down after, uh, after Katrina. Uh, housing still is, is in bad shape in Katrina because they had stuff they could use and they didn't want to repair it. Uh, I, I think there are lots of shovel-ready projects around and, and still are, as well as, as new construction possibilities if you, if you want to do it. You, you t didn't you do work on infrastructure investment, mm -hmm. Bob? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think that uh, Bob's right that it, it's it's partly a problem of uh, of imagination. It's also uh, sort of closely relatedly, I think, a, a problem of sort of preemptive surrender. Right? This is this is this <laughs> thought that well, well, of course it's not going to succeed. Right? Of course it'll never get through Congress. Of course we won't be able to do it. So we won't even think about it. We won't even start planning for it. Uh, but in fact, that's a terrible tragedy. And as, as um, uh, Jeff just mentioned, uh, by dint of the boost to employment and the boost to public revenue that significant um, public infrastructure investment would bring about. Um, it wouldn't be nearly as uh, as as, as uh, sort of hard hitting against the deficit as as many tend to think. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to sort of overclaim and, and and suggest that it would be entirely self financing, but it would be significantly more self financing than people seem to realize. Uh, a lot of people out here have probably noticed uh, in the last few days, uh, Brad DeLong and uh, and uh, Larry Summers. Uh, put out a, a paper sort of giving a sort of theoretical explanation, a sort of an update or a sort of a, a, the state of the art uh, rendition of the, the sort of classic uh, neo Keynesian argument uh, on behalf of um, uh, fiscal policy, in, in particular in the form of um, uh, infrastructure investment, in such a uh, showing that it, there, there can be circumstances in which, I mean, particularly when you're, when you're sort of near the, the, the zero lower bound um, uh, of interest rates where monetary policy is concerned, uh, and you've got significant uh, idle capacity, um, that some well-targeted forms of infrastructure investment could be indeed fully self-financing. If only we had something like that. Yeah. 
I mean, it's just, it seems like the people who are currently in the White House, uh, well, at least in, until recently in the White House, have just just not been prepared to countenance these these things, maybe because they've just figured, well, it would be stillborn given the current Congress. But I, I don't know that that's true, right? I mean, it seems to me that you, you won't really know until you actually make a bold claim, right? But if you if you say, well, we won't even talk about, um, uh, we won't even countenance the possibility of single-payer health insurance, and we'll look for some kind of strange kind of uh, patchwork uh, 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 bill of the kind that they ended up uh, passing, uh, maybe that'll get through. But of course, that doesn't seem to be working out so well at the, at the moment. Um, and maybe it's better actually to go ahead and, uh, and make a bold claim, make a, 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 a bold gambit. Uh, Anne. Thanks, Anne Hess. Um, I actually lived on a farm in west central Wisconsin for 10 years, and I just want to put into the mix the impact of the Rural Electrification Act, and that's what the government did and how it completely changed the lives of women in particular, but the ability for farmers to do their work in a totally different way. And I wanted to ask a question. Why was Fannie Mae privatized in 1968? Why did Johnson do that? It, uh, it was a way to get the debt off the books, basically. Uh, the debt was on the federal budget. The debt were, uh, I think it was a, uh, an idea of Jim Tobin, who later won a Nobel Prize. Uh, the debt of Fannie Mae appeared on the federal budget. And it, by and large, at that point anyway, it was as simple as that. It got much more complicated because uh, this whole privatization idea took over America and we started compensating these CEOs and uh, uh, other executives at Fannie Mae as if they were running Goldman Sachs. And things got out of hand in the late 1990s and 2000s, but not really before that. Um, over here, sir. Uh, yeah. Hi. I just thought I might refer to a much more pervasive role of government in the economic development of the United States, starting, which is just seems to me have got sort of lost and forgotten in the general discourse, starting with Hamilton's, Alexander Hamilton's policy of protection, which is what led to the industrialization of the United States, catching up with Europe and eventually surpassing it. Uh, of course, there are other very important, right? People don't seem to know the first telegraph in this country, between Baltimore and, and Washington, D.C., was, uh, was undertaken by the government. You would have had no internet with, unless the government had had a very... These are very dramatic examples of both policy, which have had a very pervasive influence on the development of the American economy and its catch up with the rest and so becoming a leading economic producer in the world. Part of lack of absence of that awareness is quite extraordinary, and I think one needs to do something to raise that kind of awareness of the kind of role the historically the United States government has played. Uh, let me continue out here. There were, uh, I know, sir. <coughs> Hi. People on the right make the argument that the New Deal was ineffective and it was only the stimulus of World War II that really brought the country out of depression, if you uh, could address that. It's true. It's also silly. <coughs> it's like saying the Normandy invasion uh, didn't end World War II, so why should we do it? It was a step in the right direction. Uh, I, I would argue that uh, we wouldn't be talking about that had not Roosevelt done two things. A, pull the plug on CWA. I mean, even the Wall Street Journal could see the stimulus there. Uh, and B, in, in 36, after the election, he pulled the plug again, or at least he backed off uh, from the CCC, the WPA, the PWA, and we plunged immediately into a recession. And by 38, it looked like 29. And his advisors finally talked him into restarting or, or reinvigorating the public works programs, and things went back up. We went from 25% unemployment at the beginning of the Depression to something, you know, between 10 and 15 at the end. But had those programs been going full bore throughout the 30s, I don't think there would have been any argument about the, the New Deal ending the Depression. Yeah. <clears throat> I just want to reinforce that. It's very important. You know, the, there was this. Uh, a, a set of uh, panels at the Council on Foreign Relations, of all places, trying to claim that it was the New Deal that caused the Great Depression. 
uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that permanently damaged the reputa reputation of the council. I participated angrily in the, one of those panels. Uh, but the fact is, Roosevelt stopped. He, under pressure from the same sorts of people who are running economic policy in Europe right now, saying this would all lead to a huge inflation we'd never have to manage. You have to accept pain and wring it all out. And of course, unemployment started to soar again in 1937. Also, the Federal Reserve uh, raised interest rates in that period. Uh, can, so I, can I ask the three of you, before we go back, just to stay on that point for a moment. So it's useful to remind ourselves that Roosevelt uh, didn't always get it right uh, and, and had to be pushed. So you characterized it as advisors uh, convinced him. Any role of social movements in the United States in the 1930s that, that pushed the administration in the right direction? Is there anything to be said about what public pressure might do or is it really a purely internal kind of uh, uh, inside the White House kind of dynamic we're talking about? There were... Uh, <clears throat> movements of sorts. New Yorkers will probably remember the, the Workers' Alliance, which was a, a radical organization uh, and, and included a lot of WPA workers, and they had to have strikes or tried to have strikes and so forth. Uh, I don't know that it was terribly influential, but they were out there, and, and when people are out there and saying certain things, uh, even if you're not going along with it, it pushes you uh, at least <coughs> to step back a little bit or to step forward in this case. Uh, but I, I don't know that much was going on beyond that. Well, I, you know, I, there was a general fear. I, I think there's a kind of naivete on the part of these people to say, the new, you know, why do we have the New Deal? Just let it all work out and self-adjust and all yeah. that uh, stuff that doesn't work historically. The, the, there was the rise of communist Russia. There was a great fear of a rise of communism in the U.S. There was great fear of social unrest, even though it didn't quite come to that all kinds of stuff. We now have under the, exactly the same kind of thinking. We have serious riots in Greece. We have potential political or social instability in Spain uh, and, and Portugal. Um, so, you know, th this is history repeating itself in the worst. But you are, you're citing that as a reason for Roosevelt, uh, those fears causing Roosevelt to pull the plug prematurely on some of these programs? No, no, the, opposite. the other way around. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah sorry. Uh, Ma'am, you've had your hand up for front row, red jacket. <clears throat> Helen Ginsburg, National Jobs for All Coalition. Um, I want to compliment uh, Robert Leininger for a wonderful presentation. Really? What disturbs me is that this presentation should be nationally known, and I hope that the Roosevelt and and Jeff Madrick are going to help to do that. Uh, I wonder if there's been any attempt to reach down into the curriculum of high schools um, on this involving students and faculty in finding out what did the New Deal or what did these programs do in our city or our town. Uh, I say that because at Brooklyn College, I gave my, one of my classes an assignment to uh, research what did, what did the New Deal or what did WPA do in Brooklyn? And by the way, um, Brooklyn College also had WPA projects. Probably. And my God, they came up it, it was hard work to decipher which was built and part of a yes. building was built, <laughs> but they were really impressed. I mean, having found this out themselves and something that they could relate to, hey, this, this um, lily pond, which is the center of wonderful life at Brooklyn College, was built by WPA, which has been either forgotten or trashed. And when somebody discovers it, how do you get or how do you get publicity for your 
one idea. Uh, in Arizona, a bunch of us put together what's called a heritage tourism map with the help of the Humanities Council, which uh, shows the state. It shows 50 New Deal projects uh, on one side of the map, and then little pictures and descriptions on the other side. Uh, we pushed this as much as we could into high schools. What they do with it, I don't know. Uh, Joe, over here. We may be, you know, Roosevelt's pretty well placed to do this kind of thing, and it's a very good idea. We do have a, a college pipeline network that's quite extraordinary. We have a new program. Uh, that Hillary does, starting with Joe Stiglitz, a kind of educational program. I don't know if we're reaching all the way down to high school level, but I think that's a darn good idea, especially at a time when there's a big movement to teach high school students economics, and, it t and the requirement is that it be consensus economics, which means it's got to be mainstream economics, which, in my view, uh, is accountable for a lot of the problems we're in. Mike, can yeah. I put in a plug for the uh, California New Deal, Living New Deal Project? They've got an interactive map. You can log on. You can see California. You can move around and, and pinpoint what area you want to, and it'll show you a bunch of, of New Deal projects. Not in any case, any way comprehensive. Uh, Gray Brecken, who got this idea some years ago and got a foundation grant, he was going to do it all in two years. Uh, <laughs> he's still working on it, but there's a good start. You can go to the Loving New Deal project and see a lot of New Deal in California. Okay, Joe. Uh, just a uh, comment and then a question. Um, the, the comment is that I, I worry that the, the last response is understated to some degree the importance of pressures from below, social movements in the New Deal. Um, I certainly think that there was a considerable amount of labor unrest. Um, and if you look particularly at the passage of Social Security, the pressure of the Townsend movement uh, and the, you know, the Townsend clubs, which had over a million members in 1935. And, and Huey Long. Yeah, and Huey Long. Um, and Father Coughlin and a lot of other things going on that there was that there was tremendous public pressure from below and although the streets were not filled across the nation um, there was a very viable threat of social unrest and, and there was great movement in FDR's agenda between what he ran on in 1932 and the considerably more ambitious activities uh, he pursued in government those pressures had something to do with it uh, the question is actually for Bob Hockett um, I was just absolutely fascinated by the LLC history um, there and I was curious about the sort of, uh, to put some years on sort of when we moved from the general partnership model to the sort of uh, public purpose model of the corporate, you know, corporate charter and that. Um, but I also, it sort of stopped short of explaining where we went from there. And, and I was curious if you could say a few more words about uh, how the LLC sort of goes from this model of uh, we use the market to achieve certain public purposes and that justifies limited liability to the much broader model. And was that government driven that shift or was that something that happened in some sort of piecemeal gradual way of extension or what's the story there? Yeah, so I mean the first shift is, is from um, the general partnership to the limited partnership form, uh, which happens fairly early and what that essentially does is recognize a new class of partner uh, in the partnership and essentially these are people who remain passive uh, and only contribute capital um, and as long as they don't participate in the sort of decision making or the actual activities uh, of the partnership, uh, they are sort of let off the hook, right? So the thought is that um, I guess, you know, presumably that the, the, the best way to sort of rationalize the decision to sort of allow for this development is to say, well, as long as you keep these people passive, they don't introduce a significantly larger element of risk. They're not going to bring sort of more vulnerability or more risk into the world. There's, there's not apt to be a lot more in the way of sort of tortious activity or sort of toxic tort or, or that sort of thing that results in lots of sort of mass damages to people who haven't really voluntarily uh, interacted with the firm uh, as long as you keep these people passive. Um, where things begin to get a little bit more interesting is when you get to the corporate form, uh, which comes... Uh, uh, again, in, in, at least in this country and in the UK, it, it sort of develops a bit later than it did in the continent of Europe. So it's, it's largely a 19th century phenomenon. Uh, and there, um, what you do is you, you, know, you basically recognize limited liability for all these passive investors. You essentially create a kind of super limited partnership, right, where you've got lots more limited partners, so to speak, than you have general partners. Uh, and indeed, the general partners gradually sort of convert over to being managers, where they're not even necessarily part owners any longer. And that's pretty much where things are in the 19th uh, and well into the 20th century 
as well, down into the 1970s, 1980s. Um, and one sort of mitigating factor uh, in the case of the corporate form, it was thought, uh, one factor that sort of mitigated against the additional degree of risk and the possibility of externalization of risk by uh, the limited liability uh, uh, shield uh, in the case of the corporation was the so-called double taxation regime, right, where you, you, bo you tax not only the shareholders for their capital gains or for the dividends that they realize out of the firm, but you also uh, uh, tax the firm itself. And so you could kind of, I mean, at least if you were sort of, if, if you viewed the world through sort of rose-colored glasses, as many Americans are apt to do, and as I myself am often apt to do, you could say, well, this is a kind of social insurance in a sense that sort of makes up for or in some way mitigates the additional risk that's brought into the world by dint of the limited liability regime itself. All of that, so far, so good, but you have to start taking off the rose-colored glasses when you turn, when you move into the 1980s, right? Because that's when we start getting into these new forms of limited liability firm, which basically end up, uh, where you end up getting passed through taxation of the kind that partnerships have, meaning you don't have double taxation, meaning you're not collecting that, you know, um, sort of optimistically called so form of social insurance uh, in the form of the, uh, the uh, taxation of the entity, and at the same time uh, conferring liability on people, and now not even requiring them to be passive any longer in order to enjoy limited liability. And essentially, this is just a, a, a simple sort of public choice story, I think, right? You had basically professional organizations. There was a, a perceived or a manufactured uh, liability crisis in the 1980s. Does that sound vaguely familiar? I suspect it does. Um, where you've got uh, lawyers, accountants, uh, and doctors saying, I don't want to be potentially vicariously liable for what my partners do. You know, when my partner physician leaves a scalpel in somebody's stomach, you know, and then sews them back up, I don't want to be potentially liable for that. Um, and so we, we, we would like to have limited liability for ourselves as well. We could only be vicariously liable for what our underlings do on our behalves or in our names but, or under our direction, but we can't be liable for what our partners are doing. That form really began, that, that kind of limited liability without um, uh, any sort of, uh, uh, sort of mitigating uh, taxation of the entity began really to take off state by state. Basically, you had professional organizations, lawyers, accountants, doctors, lobbying state legislatures, and then state after state after state uh, began to pass these things. For a while, there was still a kind of mitigation in that uh, uh, industries where there was significant risk uh, attending the kinds of activities that were sort of de definitive of the industry in particular um, would be required to maintain liability insurance, at least. Um, but over time, those requirements withered away as well. So we basically, in effect, what you saw was a trajectory here that more or less recapitulated that that you saw in the case of the corporation itself, which began as, again, a limited purpose entity with limited, limited liability, uh, until it, where, where, and, and it, which, you know, evolved into something where limited liability was no longer conditional but became more a matter of right than privilege. And it's sort of the same story with these smaller entities, these variations in the partnership form that involve limited liability, where essentially what we do is say, well, at first, we're at least going to require you to maintain a liability insurance, and then little by little we sort of drop those requirements. And so now you actually do end up having, you know, sort of some tort victims don't end up ever being made whole, right? And people, and you'll have judges saying, well, that's why limited liability exists. So. Thank you. Uh, we've, we're a little over. Uh, I'm sorry for the people who still have questions. We have to sign up a very good panel. Uh, we have a lunch break now, uh, and I think you want people back. Don't get any chairs yet. Uh, want people back here by 145, right? Because no later than 145. No later, because we have yeah. the Attorney General of New York, terrific public servant Eric Schneider, be introduced by the terrific Roosevelt Institute board member and nation editor Katrina Vandenhovel. Then there will be panels moderated by Rob Johnson on big government and higher taxes and peak growth, and Ellen Chesler. Both Rob and Ellen are fellows at Roosevelt on equality and social justice. So uh, thanks to the panelists uh, for terrific discussion and all of you. Jeff, do you have anything else I need to say? Okay, thanks.